out to use both controls, U1 and U2, simultaneously, then the Kalman rank condition to be fulfilled is to take, on one hand, the matrix A for the dynamics, and the other, on the other hand, on the control side, you just build the matrix B, just adding or, say, uh, superposing the column vector B1 and the column vector V2, right? This will be a matrix N times 2. This is what I'm saying here. It, this is if you are allowed to use both controls. But when we talk, this is what I say, right? If you are allowed to control with both controls simultaneously, there is nothing new. You just build the, you know, the matrix n times 2, which is, you know, the superposition of one column vector b1 and one column vector b2. And then it's just about checking this, uh, say, Kalman rank condition between the matrix A of the dynamics and B for the control. But when we are looking for switching controls, then, then you need to guarantee that they are never active simultaneously. So typically you will impose this kind of restriction, one U1 and U2, times U1 and U2 equals zero. Meaning that either one or the other, either one or the other, thank you, thank you, either one or the other, has to be zero. Okay, so now there are several ways in which you can do that. So one possibility is to say, okay, what I do is I just do a partition of the interval zero capital D a priori, right? So I divide the interval in some pieces, right? And then in some pieces I use the control U1 and the other pieces I use the control B2. This will correspond at the level of minimizing the corresponding functional j to taking this. Rather than using the functional that will correspond to controlling in both components simultaneously, that will be a functional in which I add this and that, in this case, I will, yes, I will use less. Because I will use one in some subintervals and the other one in the other subintervals. But in this way, I am, say, setting up a priori what is the distribution of controls when each of them is acting. And maybe this is not optimal, right? This is like deciding I will use my left hand and the right hand, you know, exactly with a given periodicity. But maybe I will realize this is not the best strategy because actually I have more strength on the right than on the left, right? So maybe when I am playing, I will realize that uh, maybe I could continue longer with this one, right? And use less this one. And that my action will be more efficient. So why establishing a priori a switching pattern? In other words, can we control the system in a way that the switching pattern between the two controllers will emerge somehow spontaneously? And the answer is yes. In that case, what you need to do is this. And once you, you, know, you train yourself in thinking on how the functional at the level of observability, the one I am using to compute the control, how this is related to the control strategy, you will see that this one is a very natural one to use. Do you agree? So you see, is this functional coercive? Yes, of course it is, because the max is actually larger than the addition of both. Well, the max is not larger than the addition of those of both, but is larger than half of the addition of both. So if you have observability with the addition of both, with a constant that twice is twice bigger, you have observability also with the max of both. Therefore, you have that this functional is convex. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Uh, can you give me one uh, nap? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So this functional is coercive, is convex, therefore it has a minimizer. And what happens then at the minimizer? It is not that hard to check. Because what do you expect? Basically, when you try to write the Euler-Lagrange equation for this problem, there will be two possibilities. Either you are computing the derivative at a time where the max is given by the first, or a time where the max is given by the second one. When the max is given by the first, the first one is active. When the max is given by the second one, the second one is active. OK? So this is the idea. So the point is that you, there are some, say, uh, technical conditions in which you have to make sure that, you know, you need some extra conditions to make sure that they are, they are not exactly the same for an interval, because in then there will be some kind of uh, oscillating uh, pattern. But uh, the idea I wanted to, say, communicate is that once you understand the way uh, control and observability are linked and how this observability through these ideas of minimizing functionals can be used to build controls, you can do many variants. Okay? So an exercise you can do also is the following. So is, uh, is uh, uh, consider the following controls. Right. So, for instance, you could relate for p equal to, you get the analytic control, which is of minimal L2 norm. For p equal 1, you get the bam bam control, which is of L infinity minimal norm, right? What do you think you will get when p goes to infinity in the opposite case? What is the dual of L infinity? When p goes to infinity, yes, there you get the L infinity norm. And the dual of L infinity is, well, it's not totally a dual, but I mean, you have to be uh, the careful with this. It's like L1 or can be what? Measures. Measures. So you see, in one case, the optimality means controls are very smooth. For p equal 1, controls are back bang, right? And for p equal infinity, what will I expect? Uh, what is the extremality condition I will expect? It's just one point. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but w in one point, what? There is no room in that one, uh, one point, right? Constant. Huh? Constant. Constant. Like a delta? A delta, right? Precisely. When p is equal to infinity, you get controls which are Dirac deltas which are the controls of minimal L1 norm. Okay, so this is what is called impulsional control. Okay. Because what is the trajectory you achieve when So, impulse control, this is when Does this mean that it's sparse or not sparse? Yeah, I mean this is a sparse, right? In particular this is a sparse, but it's a very uh, precise uh, statement, right? So, to some number 
So the claim in this case is MI can be positive or negative, of course, can be switching sign. The TIs are concentrated in different locations, but uh, typically whenever you have controllability for a finite dimensional system, if you build a control with minimal, say, L1 norm, which corresponds to taking the limit of these functionals as P goes to infinity, then you get this kind of impulse control. Now, you see, what is the kind of trajectory you get for impulse control? This is what I wanted to draw. So, what kind of trajectory you get for x? You start from x0, right? And before the first direct delta appears, you have the free dynamics, right? Then, when you have a, the first delta appearing, then there is a direct delta here. Uh, this means what? This means a jump on the initial datum. Sleepy? Yeah, it's siesta time, right? So there is a jump. Right? This is when the, the, the mass B star M1 delta T1 appears. Once you go cross, you cross this first direct delta again, the control is zero, and then you continue again the free dynamics. And then there is another jump. And then, and then, you know, and this is what you typically see in space missions and in many of the, you know, science fiction movies, right? So what do you do? You launch, you know, you have a lot of, you have to use a lot of energy, direct delta, to launch the shuttle, but once you are in a, you know, in a geostationary orbit, you just uh, turn the engine off, right? It's the day you want to switch to another uh, trajectory that you, uh, you know, start the engine again to full power, right? See? In what situation do you choose what, which control to use? Well, it will be again a, a, a change in zero, right? I mean, what I mean is uh, between the different fees. Oh. Do you use, when do you use impulse? When do you use uh, band band? When do you use band? I mean, this is. Uh, I think this depends very much. So, for instance, I will not use. Uh, if you are, uh, if you are a bus driver for the public transportation system, you take p equal two, right? You will not take uh, bang bang. You will rather take neither take this one, right? But if you are, uh, for instance, uh, you know, on a boat, uh, you will probably use uh, this kind of control strategy, right? So you, you have to cross the ocean, right? You will try to get into the current that is driving you across the ocean so that you can stop, relax, read, you know, while you are being driven. And when you are close to the coast again, then you exit by using the another, say, impulse control, right? So it depends very much on the kind of uh, but but this is I mean bang bang is what can be implemented more easily for instance in the electronics it's used the bang bang right yeah. because this yeah. is just a switching right yeah, but this is for space missions this is very much used because you don't have to keep the engine on right you just you know use the inertia of the system say the tunnels right the, the spontaneous say tunnels that the dynamics uh, generates that allow you to go from one place to another freely without any oil consumption and then you focus on these switchings, right? But then it's of course a matter of time as well because you see when I say I switch off the control then I say I follow a continuous arc of the system then I'm doing nothing on the system it means that I am traveling here with the velocity of the system, right? If this is too slow, I have to be patient. Right? If you want to accelerate, then, right? Okay. But uh, from a mathematical point of view, uh, so exercise, try to understand the different, say, P's. For instance, what is the Euler-Lagrange equation for, uh, corresponding to the different P's and how do you characterize the controls you achieve that way. Okay? I just wanted to show you especially this uh, switching case. Okay. 
Okay, so now, uh, before we get to the wave equation, a stabilization. So, the inconvenience of all this, you know, this duality methodology, uh, Pontiagin maximum principle, some other people, this system I have written where I write the equation for x and the equation for phi with two terminal and uh, initial conditions for x, no initial or terminal conditions for phi. Uh, this is also called in the literature optimality system for obvious reasons because it's the one that is characterizing the optimal control in the sense that the norm in L2 or in L infinity is minimal. The inconvenience of this is that you have to compute the control during the time interval 0 capital T before you implement it, but you have to do it globally, right? So this is not a real-time control. Then, uh, as we have shown yesterday in the case of the harmonic oscillators, once uh, you have a good understanding of the dynamics, you can even, you know, tune the dissipation rate of the system by choosing different dampers. So how are the two things related? Stabilizability and controllability. And I will do it in a, in a simple example. So assume now that you are dealing with an um, ODE system where A is anti-adjoint, right? So assume A is anti-adjoint. For instance, an harmonic oscillator and a Rodinger equation in, multi, in infinite dimensions. What I'm saying here is also true in infinite dimensions, actually, or the Korteweg debris equation, the wave equation, they are all examples of systems generated by anti-adjoint operator so that the energy is constant, is conserved. Okay? And now we add a control. In the presence of the control, we have checked the system is controllable. But my complaint is that the control U I have computed is open loop. And I have to work in the global time interval 0 capital T to compute U. And this U is not given in real time as a function of the state. OK. In any case, because in case of the absence of control, the norm of the solution is fixed. Why? I multiply here by x, scalarly. I get to the left the time derivative of the scalar product of xx, which is the norm of x squared. And I get axx with a antisymmetric, which is 0. So I get this. So the norm of the uncontrolled system is constant. So it means that in the, in the Euclidean or in the infinite dimensional space where I am living, the trajectories are, you know, living on the boundary of a sphere whose radius is given by the initial datum, right? Okay, so it's, it's a rotation in some sense in a, a sphere of dimension n. Okay, question is, can I stabilize the system by means of a feedback control? So question, can I build a control u of t? which is given as a linear function of the state x so that the system I get in which I plug here u equal lx so that the new dynamics right, with this feedback control is exponentially decay. Right? Can I build L so that there is an exponential decay with rate omega? Okay. And then the answer to the problem is, yes, I can do that, provided the controllability condition between A and B are, is fulfilled. And actually, in this particular case where A is anti-adjoint, I can simply take L to be minus B star. OK, proof. So what I, my claim is that in this particular case where things can be more easily written, where A is anti-adjoint, I can stabilize the system exponentially by taking the feedback operator minus B star X. What is the result I get? I don't get controllability in finite time. I mean, I cannot expect this system to get to zero in finite time. Why? Because this is an ODE system. This is an ODE 
generated by the new matrix A minus B, B star. If this will get to zero in finite time, solving the equation backwards, I will get zero all the time. So I will not get to zero in finite time. But I can get as much as is possible because I will achieve exponential decay. Okay? So this is the claim. And the claim is that for doing this, the only thing I need is once more the Kalman rank condition. Okay? So the Kalman rank condition, which is equivalent to controllability, which is equivalent to observability, which allows me to then build controls of minimal norm, minimizing functionals in the context of the calculus of variations and gradient descent systems, this is also, in some sense, equivalent to exponential stabilization through appropriate damping operators, in this case, L equal minus B star. Okay? Good. Proof. Let me show you that with this particular choice of L equal minus B star, I get the exponential decay. And the proof will also give you a hint of why I have chosen L to be minus B star. Okay? Assume, uh, recall that I was totally free to choose the operator L, but that B was given, right? So you can tune the feedback operator as you wish, but in the end, this feedback L, right, will go through the filter of B. And in practice, what uh, this theorem is telling me is that this B is telling you that the appropriate feedback is then minus B star. Okay? Okay. So, proof of the exponential decay. First thing to do, let's check whether the energy, at least, is being dissipated, right? This is the first I, you know, I have to check. Is the energy being lost? Because, recall, in the absence of feedback, when u was zero, the energy was constant. Now, with this new feedback, is the energy decaying? Well, I multiply by x. On the left, I get again the half time derivative of the norm x squared. On the right, I get minus b b star x x. So I pass here, you know, the adjoint, and I see, oh yes, this is negative. And then what I'm doing is I have a dynamical system, right? The energy of the solution is distributed all along all the components of x, x1, xn, or even x infinity if I am dealing with an infinite dimensional system. And then at every time I am, you know, removing out of the system the energy concentrated on the components B star. So I'm not removing all the energy, but just the energy concentrated through, you know, the one I can see through B star. Okay, now I integrate this equation from zero to capital T. I see here the difference of the energy at time capital T minus the energy at the origin. And this is how much energy I have, you know, dumped out of the, ener of the system, right? So there is a minus here, of course. There is also implicitly a minus here because the energy at time T is less than the energy at time zero. Okay, this is why there is a minus. Good. Then my claim is, this is an identity, and my claim is that in order out of this identity to conclude the exponential decay, it is sufficient to prove this observability inequality. Right? You see that this observability inequality is very similar to the one we have proved before, except for the fact that now I have to prove it for the complete system, for the one in here. Okay? But it's the same inequality. So now, before I discuss this inequality, why this plus this produce the exponential decay? Well, it's very simple. You see, this is telling you that this integral is giving you an upper bound on x0. With a minus sign, you have an upper bound of this in terms of minus x0. 
If you put the xt on one side and the x0 on the other, what you see is this. In particular, you see that the map that is mapping the initial datum into the final datum capital T is a contraction. And then you have the semigroup property which tells you what's going on from 0 to capital T is then repeated again and again from t to 2t, 2t to, to 3t, and then you get the exponential decay with a rate that you can compute as in here. So then, once you have the energy dissipation identity, energy dissipation identity, which is a straightforward out of the choice we have done of the feedback operator, and you prove this observability inequality, then you have the exponential decay. Now, how do you prove this observability inequality 36? How do you prove this observability inequality? Uh, the idea is very simple. The idea is that, maybe, where is it written? I don't know where it's written, well, it's implicitly there. So the idea is the following. What was the assumption? The assumption was that AB, okay. The assumption was that AB fulfilled Kalman. Okay? And this was equivalent to guaranteeing this observability inequality. Okay? This was equivalent to this. But now, I have to prove it for this system. Okay, so what are the differences between that system and this system. Well, of course, there is here some other term. Uh, here there is an A star. But what was our assumption? Our assumption was that A was anti-adjoint. So A star is minus A. So then, this system is the principal part of that one, right? So then I can say, oh, then because I know something for phi, let me write the solution of this system. I use the linear superposition for linear ODEs. I can say that the solution of that system Can be, sorry, can be decomposed that manner. Do you agree? You ask me, you have to solve the system for x, where you have an initial datum, and in some sense you have also some reminder term, minus b, b star x. But I know already something substantial about that system. What I know is that this observability inequality is true for that system, and this I know from the previous discussion because a, b fulfill Kalman. Okay, but now what is phi? Well, my claim is that out of this decomposition, x is equal to phi plus y. Why? Because if I add this plus this, what I get is exactly the same equation, and I add the initial data, and I get x0, right? So, on the other hand, phi is then a equal to x minus phi. So I already know this inequality in which the left hand is x0. Then whenever I have here b star phi, I can split according to that in two terms, b star x and b star y. Okay? 
Good. The B star X is precisely the quantity we were ready to use. But in this inequality, unfortunately, I don't have the inequality 37 I needed. I have an inequality with an extra term. I have to estimate this other term. But you see, now what is y? Well, y is something complicated. It's 2c integral from 0 to t of b star y squared. But y is what? y is the solution of this OD where the initial datum is 0 and the applied force is b star x. So by the variation of constant formula, all this is bounded by this. And then you are done. Okay? So I repeat, by the variation of constant formula, all the energy of y, in particular this specific quantity, is bounded above by a suitable constant times this quantity in here. So then putting together this plus the estimate of this out of this, say, non-homogeneous uh, system with right-hand side term, you get 37 and you are done. So controllability implies stabilization. Actually there is more, uh, there is this discussion we did yesterday, but actually uh, there is the possibility of, of, of getting an arbitrary the decay rate, so there is this classical result on pole assignment that says that whenever a system is controllable, then you can find a feedback operator which stabilizes the system so that the eigenvalues of the new stable system are exactly the ones you like, right? Okay? So the pole assignment says that if on the complex plane, if in the complex plane you tell me that you want the system to be stable with the poles in those points, then there is always an L, which of course depends on this choice of poles lambda, for which the system with feedback decays and decays exactly according to that pattern. Okay? This is the most uh, natural uh, way to do. So you have a linear system in which you know, the novelty for you is the addition of that term. So I am just using this classical decomposition that says the solution of a non-homogeneous system is the solution of the homogeneous system with a particular solution of the non-homogeneous one. So taking the one that uh, takes the initial atom zero. Okay. Again, this is a very general principle that uh, you can apply for infinite dimensional systems, for systems in which there is time dependency, I mean this kind of linear decomposition. In nonlinear systems, of course, this has to be applied very carefully because you know you cannot say that adding two different solutions you build a solution of the same nonlinear system. But again, these are like meta ideas that you can try to exploit even, you know, in a scenarios where things are not totally uh, ready for an automatic or direct application, right? But the idea is that once you have a, an observability inequality, once more, we got a lot. I was also able to prove the fact that there is exponential decay by a suitable feedback, just by, you know, doing some massage to the original inequality. Okay? So let me now move to waves. Okay, so this is the, actually, the f we now start uh, the course, right? So the previous lectures yesterday and today were introduction, right? But now the advantage is that we know everything is needed. Now it's going to be very, very quick, right? So, okay, remember this, right? Acoustic waves. And then you say, okay, what is the model for acoustic waves? And you say, oh, this is the wave equation. 
But the wave equation is also a model for you know, seismic waves or flexible structure, oftentimes in fluids, in elasticity. I mean, there are many, many, you know, in the human cardiovascular system, they will tell you that the arteries, the wall of the arteries, they, they vibrate when, you know, when the blood is going through, and they are also elastic, uh, you know. Uh, many, many irrigation systems. There will be plenty of systems in which, in a way or another, you will find hyperbolic systems, wave-like equations. So there are many reasons to deal with this. Uh, of course, if you want to have a complete understanding of wave theory, this is a very complicated topic, right? There are many, many different aspects of wave theory that uh, will require, uh, you know, a good knowledge not only of uh, control theory, optimal design or optimization, as we discussed today, but the spectral analysis, numerical analysis, PDEs. Maybe you are dealing with waves on networks, not only on a single pipe. Then. There are many, many things you can do which could be quite complicated, but at least for the basics, we already know what has to be done. So this is the simplest, say, distributed parameter system with control. So this is the wave equation by D'Alembert. So D'Alembert was uh, the genius that said, if you are looking to the vibrations of the chord of the guitar, this is done according to this equation, which is telling you that time acceleration is equal to curvature, right? This is a very geometric PDE. Right? Which is telling you I have a chord or a string now occupying the interval 0, 1 in x. And then at every x, I, you know, and every time, right, y x t, positive or negative, is giving you the height of the displacement of this, say, point particle x of the string. And then D'Alembert said, in our first approximation, the motion of the chord of the guitar is given by this very simple equation which says y t t is equal to y x x and as I said this wave equation is telling me time acceleration of the particle displacement is equal to curvature and this is something you can experience yourself right so if you take uh, the chord of the guitar and you pull a lot, right, you are producing a huge, say, curvature and then when you release, this will produce a huge vibration with a lot of acceleration. While if you pull only a little bit, you know, the, you know, the, the curvature is very low and then the vibration you will get will be very mild, okay? Julia, you understand? See? Okay. Good. Now, uh, the game to play is one of the chords of the guitar is fixed, right? And I am playing with the other one, right? So in this case, I release one of the extremes of the chord and I am allowed to play, right? This is like this uh, kid's game in which you have two kids playing with a vibrating chord, except that in the particular example I am considering here, there is only one kid, right? Sorry. There is only one kit to the right, the other one is missing. So this extreme is attached, you know, to, to, to the wall, wherever, or the seat, or the table, and then only one person is playing. So the game is whether by making suitable displacements of the value y at x equal 1, then acting through this boundary control, this is a boundary control for a distributed parameter system. I can, for instance, drive vibrations to zero. Okay? Okay, so the first thing to check is well, uh, the first thing to check is maybe, maybe I don't need to do anything, right? Maybe if I am very lucky, I just take the control V equals zero, the lazy control, right? 
maybe by taking v equals zero things occur spontaneously or even if I don't get you know zero exactly in a final time maybe I get an exponential decay of the energy which will not be very very far from the goal right so let me check first what happens when v equals zero what happens actually is that for the solution of this d'Alembert equation that by the way can be computed using d'Alembert formula or the Fourier formula you can check in your preferred books on, on PDEs right you can you can call it an exercise write the solution of the uncontrolled wave equation explicitly both using Fourier series and d'Alembert formula another exercise you have two explicit formulas for this now if I don't use any control there is nothing I get why because in that case as it occurs for the harmonic oscillator if I multiply the equation by the velocity yt and I integrate with respect to x from 0 to 1 right what I get is simply the conservation of the energy Why? Well, just uh, multiply here by yt, then the integral of yt t times yt is simply the time derivative of the integral of yt squared. When you get here, you have to be a bit more careful because you say, what is the integral of yxx yt? Well, I can integrate by parts, right? And then I say that this is minus the integral of yx yxt plus the boundary conditions which are yx yt from 0 to 1 but I say they vanish why yx yt vanishes in the absence of control is <coughs> because y vanishes so there is no reason why x will vanish but if y vanishes for all time the time derivative of y both at 0 and at 1 will vanish as well and this will be zero and this is again the time derivative of y x squared so you get the conservation of energy so this means that this is an harmonic oscillator in the infinite dimensional system in this wave equation there is not any uh, damping effect friction effect that is being taken into account therefore this is an ideal chord right in which the initial energy of the vibration will be preserved forever Okay, so it's not very realistic, but in a short time, time uh, range, this will be a very nice model. Okay, so then, do I need the action of the control? Yes, I do. Because without the action of this control, I cannot even diminish, right, the energy of the solution. It's not that I cannot get to zero, it's actually that I cannot go below, you know, the energy level that is given by the initial data of the system so I definitely need to apply the control okay okay so then we will understand later uh, why but let me move on then I said this is a controllability problem so in the ODE case I understood that controllability was equivalent to observability right but observability for the adjoint what is the adjoint equation to the wave equation? You remember? The game to play was whenever there were derivatives, you know, just pass the derivatives to, you know, to the other side. Of course, by integration by parts, there was always a minus I have to pay. But in the case of the wave equation where, say, there is an even number of derivatives here and there, when you build the adjoint, what happens? 
you get the same wave operator, it's self-adjoint. Right? The, the control disappears, so now you get the boundary conditions. And you say, oh, but this is fantastic because this is really the wave equation we were used to deal with in the first class on partial differential equations. Right? This is really the wave equation by D'Alembert in the absence of control. Before that, it was a little bit more tricky because, you know, nobody told me that, you know, there will be a control acting on the boundary on the wave equation. I thought, you know, we were simply using the formula for the classical wave equation with Dirichlet zero boundary conditions. This is not true for the control problem, but I'm very lucky because this is precisely the case for the adjoint system. In the adjoint system, again, V is zero, there is no control here, so the energy is conserved. And now, the corresponding observability inequality reads that way. The corresponding observability inequality says the energy of the total solution has to be less than the observed energy over the boundary in which the control was being applied for the original wave equation. So this normal derivative here is the B star. Okay, we will justify this a little bit more later. But you see, why phi x? Well, because phi x is always the complementary condition to the Dirichlet condition, right? Okay, so how do you see that phi x has to enter? Okay, let's play the game. You remember, actually, you know, a state? You can help me whenever you wish, telling me at least, okay. Please don't move because you will be tired otherwise and you need to do all those exercises, but uh, you can talk. You remember the game was you take this wave equation, zero boundary condition here, one control there, And then I said, you have to multiply the equation satisfied by y by the control, sorry, the adjoint state phi. Then phi fulfills the adjoint equation, and now you have the zero boundary condition. Multiply the equation satisfied by y by phi, and then what do you get? You get zero integral from 0 to t, integral from 0 to 1 of y t t minus y x x phi dx dt. You integrate by parts, and when integrate by parts, you pass all the derivatives from y to phi, and everything disappears because phi fulfills the, the wave equation. You get, of course, the product at the initial and the final time, right? And this is the goal from a control perspective, right? That you are relating somehow the difference in the initial and final state to the action of the control. But then you also get the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are minus the integral from 0 to t of y x phi minus y phi x, right? at x0 and x1 dt, right? And then what happens? Phi vanishes on the boundary, so all this term goes away. Phi uh, y vanishes at the left where there is no control, so this term goes also away at x equals 0. And the only one that stands is the product of y phi x at the term 1, at the, at the point 1, right? This is the control v, and you remember, according to the previous moment characterization of the control, this is precisely telling us that the corresponding observability inequality, right, is related to, you know, the quantity 
on the adjoint system that is accompanying the control, right? So this is why this is the kind of inequality we need to prove, okay? So let's see. Now, once we get to this point, forget the control problem that is always more complicated. Let us focus on this observability or observation problem, right? Interesting. It was D'Alembert formula? No? Okay. So D'Alembert formula, you have it in the Wikipedia, it's also in the in the first chapter of any book you can use. When we studied in class, it was Fritz John, but maybe nowadays it's Evans, or there are other more elementary books in PDEs you can, you can use. You will find everything you need, okay? But now let us forget about control and then focus on this. Let's think in terms of mechanics, if you wish, for a moment, right? So what I'm doing? I'm doing the following in this problem. So uh, this is very much like the problem you have to solve when you are dealing with uh, waves uh, for oil recovery, right? Whenever you are dealing with uh, natural resources, as you know, oftentimes the kind of experiments you do, you are, uh, you know, you are trying to look for whatever, water or oil, and then you, you send waves, right? And then you see whether there is something reflected. This is like the sonar when you are looking for, you know, fishes on the ocean, right? So you send a wave. If the wave doesn't ever come back, is that there was nothing underneath. However, if you receive quickly a signal, it means that, you know, soon after, you know, a few meters below, there was some kind of heterogeneity you were, you were looking for. And of course, then you have this analysis very much related to the a Snell law we did yesterday, in which, according to the how quickly and how large the amplitude of the signal you receive is, you can determine what is the depth of this interface and what is the material that is inside here. Okay, but because maybe you were looking for, uh, you know, you were looking for water and you can get uh, petrol, right? Okay. So this is very much a kind of problem people have to deal with in inverse problem theory, dealing with waves and trying to figure out out of boundary measurements, this is a boundary measurement, what is inside. Okay, so I have a, a cord which is vibrating, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, but I cannot see, right? I'm sitting outside. I'm sitting here, you know, and then somebody tells me, this is like a disco, you are outside and you just see the, you know, you feel only the shaking, right, inside, or the vibration of the music inside, and you have to guess how many people that are inside, right? So there is this wave, you know, it could be also a two-dimensional membrane, it could be a heart, Beating, right? This is actually what you do for an uh, electrocardiogram. You know, they try to analyze, you know, how is, you know, the health of your heart. But in order to do this, they don't open with a knife, right? And watch. They, they take some boundary measurements, and out of these boundary measurements, they try to determine whether it's healthy or not. So here is the same. So the heart is, the heart is biting here. And then you only have some access to a boundary measurement. Actually, you have here a single patch sitting there, right? And then what this patch is filling is this normal derivative, which is actually, you know, if we were playing chord and uh, you were hung, uh, hanging the chord over there and it was shaking a lot, you, on the other side, you have to keep it fixed. You agree with me that somehow the force you have to implement is related to this tension. So this tension, this slope here, this slope here, phi x 1t, the amplitude of this slope is definitely a measure of the amplitude of the vibration inside. Okay? In any case, this is the only quantity you can have a look, right? 
Maybe we were allowed, we could take another measurement here, but in this case we have access only to one patch, and it's placed here. We cannot get in, we cannot see in. So can you tell me whether this energy is going to be recovered or not? Well, there are many possible discussions about the wave equation. In particular, as I said, you can find this explicit formula, this is one of the exercises using Fourier, or D'Alembert for the solution of the wave equation. But there is, there is some fundamental property that everyone should know. And actually, it's very easy to see because of simply algebraic considerations. So, the wave equation is related to this operator, right? Two derivatives in time minus two derivatives in space. And this operator can be factorized into This, well, or the reverse, right? Do you agree? If you concatenate, compose these two first order partial differential operators, you get the wave operator, right? Because you apply, you know, some times difference is difference of a square, so you get precisely the wave operator. And this is precisely what D'Alembert said. What D'Alembert said is that whenever you are considering solutions of the wave equation. Solutions are of this form. Hmm? Right? So what is fx plus t? Well, fx plus t is simply a solution of the problem dt minus dx is equal to zero. And gx minus t is just the solution of dt plus dx equals zero. So these are two transport equations, two traveling wave solutions, right? One traveling to the left and the other one traveling to the right. Huh? And so what you are seeing here is that, you know, Whenever in the wave equation you introduce some initial disturbance, right? So you, you know, shake your string here a little bit, then this produces a wave that travels to the left, another one that travels to the right with velocity one. Okay, so then how do you finally propagate disturbances in the wave equation. This is what happens. You have you have a space interval 0, 1 in x 0, 1 and this is time, right? And assume, you know, there was a core that was, you know, in equilibrium, and you go and you just click over there on a given point. You just shake a little bit the cord over that point. This initial perturbation produces one wave traveling to the right and one wave traveling to the left. So the wave traveling to the left will go up to the boundary and then they w it will bounce, right? The one traveling to the right will rightly go to the right, and then after some time, it will bounce. But you remember, the exercise you had to do was, you were recording signals here, and you needed to determine how much energy there was at the initial time on the system. So the question is, do you think that in view of this propagation pattern, when waves propagate with velocity 1 to the left and to the right, do you think that you will be able to guarantee that this observability inequality is fulfilled or not? Let's vote, okay? 
So who votes yes? No, please left hands because if you left here like, the, like this, I have to then figure out whether this is yes or not. So please, uh, who votes that this inequality is going to be true? So like this is yes or not? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes to Julia? Yes. Yes, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I think some people are there to the majority, right? Just simply because, you know. <laughs> and who is voting no? <laughs> Nobody votes. And the other seven? What are you voting, Julia? What was your vote? I mean, if, if you're measuring the energy before anything is hitting on the, yeah. on the boundary, for sure it's... Uh, for sure it's yes or no? Yeah. For sure it's no. For sure it's no. Because you're not on the boundary. Well, in, partic in this case there, are, there is no interaction. Simply things propagate and don't see each other, right? So this is linear analysis, there is no interaction. Things, but, but you never know. So I said here that you, uh, you know, a guy came here and introduced some small perturbation on the wave here. Could have been done over there. You know, perturbations can be everywhere, right? So actually, in order to understand how waves uh, will propagate, you have to do some kind of decomposition analysis. You say, this is 0, 1. Then you can, in the initial, say, perturbation, you can introduce the energy wherever you wish. So here, 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 here. And whenever you introduce some perturbation on the initial data, this will produce this double front with an amplitude of this perturbation that will be, you know, corresponding to the amplitude of the initial datum over there, right? So this is like, you know, you go to the swimming pool and you throw a little stone, right? But then there are many people throwing stones and this produces many, many, many rings propagating and in the end all these waves, right, will cross each other. So this is the 1D representation of that. So we are doing this in a one-dimensional channel, right? We are throwing stones, this is producing waves, you know. So your comment, Andrea, was that the time involved in the process should matter, right? Yes. Yeah. I agree. So what is the time then? Uh, there is any... Two. Two is uh, an important time, you say, right? So the travel time, like this, and this, right? T equal to. So T equal to is an important time, right? So otherwise, before time two, Definitely, this inequality can never be true. Before time two, this inequality cannot be true. Why? Because I could not exclude, right? You see, I'm sitting here and I see nothing on my sensor. You know, the sensor says zero, 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 zero. If I rely on the sensor too soon, I will determine that there is nothing ongoing. While actually there is, because there could be some signal with a small support propagating to the left, coming back to the right, and getting there precisely slightly earlier than two, right? Because if this is of support, say, delta, waves have been oriented in that direction because this is something you can do. I said, in general, whenever you make a perturbation, there will be a signal going to the left or a signal, go, and a signal going to the right. Indeed, in general, this is true. But if you are smart, you can produce waves that only propagate in one direction. Why? Because actually you have, say, you see, on the system, you have two initial data. And depending on how you choose phi 0 and phi 1 at every x, you can regulate how much energy goes to the left front and to the right front. In particular, you could regulate x0, phi0, zero, phi1, zero, phi so that the energy goes only to the left. And then, you can build those waves. You can will build wave packets, you know, because they are very, you know, very enveloped, very concentrated here. 
the travel to the left, then of course because this width is delta, it takes time 1 minus delta to get to this boundary, and after bouncing you have to still come back to the sensor, this takes time 1. So in time, you know, t less than 2, this inequality is completely wrong. There is no constant making this inequality to occur. Why? Because for t, you know, less than 2, if t, yeah, I, the, the constant is missing there. Right? So if t is less than 2, there exists phi such that, you know, this integral over the boundary is equal to zero, while the energy of phi at zero is equal to one. Okay? That's the situation. So, this is new. In fact, in PDE setting, in infinite dimensional setting with respect to the ODE setting, in the ODE setting we said observability inequalities, they hold if the Kalman rank condition is fulfilled. And in case the Kalman rank condition is fulfilled, the observability inequality holds for all time. Now, what happens is that whether the observability inequality holds or not, it depends on the time window. For t less than 2, it is impossible to produce such a observability inequality, while for t greater than 2, I suspect we will be able to do it. So, and why I do say I suspect? Because, you know, when I analyze, you know, wave propagation from a mechanical point of view, what it really means, this is really telling me that nothing that is going on inside this system will escape to my capacity of measurement here on the boundary after time 2. Whenever it occurred originally, you know, whenever happened in this initial time when the Big Bang occurred, after time two equal to, t equal 2, it will be fully recorded on the right point of the boundary. Okay? Good. So now we have to be more say precise and try to prove this inequality. Uh, of course there is a constant missing here, right? There should be a constant here, of course, that I missed. Okay. I will come back to the proof of the, of the inequality. But now let me just discuss the controllability aspect. I say, you know, the good news about this observability inequality is that, after all, I am dealing with a classical wave equation that is treated in books. I don't need to deal with the control problem. This is just, just the pure wave equation treated in the classical books. Now, the, the question I would like to, before I concentrate on proving this inequality, let me just convince you, let me just convince you that what we have done before with this principle that observability implies controllability in a constructed manner can be applied in this case too. And the answer is the same as before. So phi zero, phi, uh, y0, zero, y1 are the initial data to be controlled. Phi zero, phi1 are the data of the adjoint system. This is the observed quantity. This is the functional that is now quadratic plus linear to be minimized in the energy space that is, uh, say, Hilbert space, if the observability inequality holds, like in here, with a constant, of course, then this functional here is coercive. It has a unique minimizer, and in case it has a unique minimizer, the control is just given by the normal derivative of this distinguished solution minimizing the functional j. So you see that the principle is exactly the same once you have the observability inequality. And this is why I told you before in the morning, I said, you can apply the same ideas to PDE systems 
or infinite dimensional systems, but I warn you, forget about the rank condition because n, it doesn't mean something very precise in the infinite dimensional case. I said, keep things at the level of observability. And this is exactly what we are doing. What I'm saying is that if you keep things at the level of observability, there is no doubt. The observability of the system, as represented by this inequality with a C, in case it holds, is in itself sufficient to prove the controllability of the system and not only this, but also to give you a constructive method to build the control whenever you choose the data y0, y1 to be controlled. Right? And this is done by minimizing this functional j. Okay? Good. So you can play with this in order to understand better this duality, but let us now focus on how to prove this inequality. Let me see what we have here. Okay, so this is uh, something else. So how do I prove this inequality? In order to prove this inequality, I need to somehow develop some understanding of uh, the wave equation. So it depends very much on what you know about the wave equation. So what do you know, uh, Yin Chen, about uh, the wave equation? What do you, you know something about this wave equation? We can try to use dark plane that uh, solution, that uh, universal solution. Sorry? That uh, f uh, x minus t. And OK, so we, yeah. we can use this uh, D'Alembert representation as two traveling waves, right? Yeah, correctly. Yeah. Actually, this is done in the books, right? But it's a bit uh, not that fast, because uh, you can help me with uh, the OK, it's here. It's not that fast. If you look in the books, they tell you, well, normally in the books they tell you, if you have to solve the Cauchy problem, right, with initial datum, phi 0 and the initial velocity phi 1, then the solution phi is the mean of phi 0 plus the average of phi 1. Right? So if this is the point xt where you are looking at, this is what you get when you develop a little bit more the argument by D'Alembert. You get that the value of the solution at any time is totally determined by the initial data on the basis of this uh, triangle of dependence, which in multi D will be a cone, right? But this is one space dimension, right? And actually, in this case, the formula is particularly simple. You simply take the extremes of the bases of this triangle, and you, you make the average, and you take the initial velocity all on the basis of this triangle, and you do the average as well. This is also telling you that there is a finite velocity of propagation for the solutions of the wave equation. So who has seen this in class? So can you please leave clearly hands, uh, one hand, only one hand? So until now, at university, only one person out of 15 has seen this formula written? No, I cannot believe it. Huh? You too. When you do this, is hand or not? Half. What, what do you mean by half? Yeah, was a course. Uh, yeah. So Mark is half or is full? No, it's full. It's full. Three credits, credits uh, yeah. Three credits course about partial differential. And what did you do then at university if you didn't do this? So, I mean, it's... You were playing cards or? <laughs> you see this? I see it differently. No. Yeah. I, I know the, uh, the answers with the uh, Fourier series. Okay, Fourier series. But uh, I mean, this is, I think this is the way it came through uh, uh, D'Alembert, right? 
Okay, we will go back to Fourier series later. But this is precisely, you know, Fourier series is particularly useful at this level because, you know, the, the books warn you, right? If you are dealing with the if you are dealing with the boundary value problem, this is not so useful. Why? Because this is useful up to this point. Because once you are above, you know, you are going beyond, you know, the limits of the boundary, right? So then the formula has to change. Right? You see what I mean? This is the formula for waves in the full space, no boundaries. Whenever there, are, there is some boundary, you know, this formula can be applied in all these triangles, but as soon as you go too much above, the, the triangle is going above, beyond the limits of your walls, of, your, of the domain. Could you explain what's the triangle? No, I'm tired, so well, I mean, this is too much. So I mean, I. But this is. I can explain. Yeah, okay. Okay, but this is not uh, ESR, right? So this is uh, fourth degree uh, at university, right? Bachelor degree. This is bachelor. This is bachelor degree. Not an engineer. This should be. No, no. <laughs> Not an engineer should never, I mean, doesn't make any sense to, for an engineer to say I'm doing control systems and they didn't see this. Sorry. I mean, something is wrong. Where did you study? Okay, so complain Belomo or whoever. <laughs> you know, I know Nicola Belomo there, right? So. He's my friend, so you can complain to him. <laughs> the problem is this. I mean, this explicit representation formulas in general, this is like green formula for the Laplacian or for the heat equation. It's very nice whenever there is no boundary. But as soon as there is boundary, then they get complicated. Right? So this is like the heat equation. For the heat equation for uh, in the full space is very easy to be represented. Because y x t is just a convolution with the Gaussian, right? But as soon as there is uh, some boundary, and real life there is always a boundary, because you are not looking to heat propagation everywhere, but we are looking to this room, or to this building, or to this lake, or, you know. Then, you know, there are reflection effects and the shape of the boundary modifies after a while solutions inside so you can essentially use these explicit formulas that are valid everywhere you can use them inside whenever you know you don't take into account the boundary effects but as soon as you take into account the boundary effects it's over so this is like you know the billiard right I mean, you could play billiard. You know what is the billiard, right? So you could play the billiard in an infinite Euclidean space. Then it will be very boring, right? Because you kick the ball, billiard. Julia, yes? yes? Kick the ball, then you go up to infinity, right? The point is that you put boundaries. And then the game becomes more interesting because you kick the ball and then you will hit here, this will come here, this will come here, then this will come here, and then we will come here and here, and then, uh, you know, and then so on, right? And then you can produce, uh, you know, effects that people don't expect. Actually, billiard is even more complicated. Why? Why the true billiard is more complicated than this? Julia, why true billiard is more complicated than that? Boundary is soft. Boundary is soft. It's elastic. So this is simply a rigid boundary, right? Like uh, the one you will, you know, you kick the ball against the boundary. But this boundary is soft. There is some deformation here, and this produces some unexpected effects. We cannot even change, right, the trajectory of the ball, right? So in billiard, you can produce, uh, you know, in the true billiard game, 
right? You can produce trajectories that will not be allowed in optics, right? Or in acoustics, right? So you can do this and then maybe stay here, right? If you are smart, you can do that. You can play with the effect and then you can remain tangent to the boundary. Something that effectively, if you are dealing with the, the Descartes reflection law, this will never occur. Okay? So this is, in general, the reason why, whenever you have boundaries, this kind of representation formulas, like uh, the one we have used by D'Alembert, as soon as you start touching the, the walls, you know, they, they start, uh, you know, not being that uh, useful. So the other one is the Fourier representation formula. Actually, there was a huge debate at the time, right? When Fourier in Paris came to his formula, he said the following. Fourier said, every solution of that wave equation will be written like uh, this. Right? And then people started complaining, saying, well, you know, but this is very particular. These are some of the solutions, and they are not all. And then there was a huge debate until people understood that Fourier was actually introducing the Fourier transform, and that, uh, indeed, in that way, you can represent all solutions, because this is simply a Fourier representation of all possible solution of the wave equation. But it took some time before people understood that the Fourier representation was exhaustive, that it was an isomorphism, that it was parseval, and so on, right? But the first one to introduce this kind of representation was Fourier. I don't know whether he did it for the heat equation or for the wave equation, but it was him who did it in a, you know, in a letter to the Academy in Paris. Okay, so do you agree that these are solutions of the wave equation? So what is phi? Phi is the superposition of some solutions in separated variables that you can see here, here, or here. So sine k pi t and sine k pi x for on one hand, and the other hand, cosine k pi t and sine k pi x. I claim both of them are solutions of the wave equations. Do you agree? You take two time derivatives. How much do you get? So you are taking two time derivatives of sinusoid or cosine. You get k squared pi squared and then a minus sign. And now you take two x derivatives. You are taking two x derivatives of sine k pi x and then you get k squared pi squared minus again. It's the same. Do you get the boundary conditions right? Yeah, because the sign has been taken. These are the eigenvectors of the Laplace operator in one space dimension, the solutions of the Stoolyville problem. You have taken the boundary conditions right. Okay? So this is one possibility. Then there are two families of coefficients, AK and BK. But actually, you have two initial data too, phi 0 and phi 1, right? How are they related? Well, what is the initial datum of such a signal? If you take the value of this at t equals 0, you get the sum of bk sine k pi x. Meaning what? Meaning that bk are simply the Fourier coefficients of phi 1. Right? And then on the other hand, if you take the time derivative of phi at t equals 0, what do you get? You get k pi a k sine k pi x, the sum, meaning that k pi a k are equal to the Fourier coefficients of phi 0. So this is what Fourier said. And everyone was amazed, and it was even kind uh, of controversial, because it was a very revolutionary idea that you take the initial datum, you decompose in this sinusoidal basis, then you run the solution corresponding to each of these, say, 
eigenfunction projections trivially by this separation of variables. And once you get them all, you envelope them all again, like, <coughs> to build the, the global solution. Right? So the idea was take the initial data, decompose in Fourier series. Each of the Fourier components, you transport it in time trivially by using this separation of variable formula. And once you have them all, you pile them and you add, and you have like an infinite sandwich, you have the solution phi of your wave equation. OK? Very good. So you see, actually, there is a, even a simpler way of, uh, apparently simpler way of representing the solutions of the wave equation. It's totally equivalent. It's like this. I, I claim that this can be written that way. Okay, I give you two minutes to get convinced that these are uh, the same representation. You tell me you are, you agree. Okay, so is correct or not? Yes. Huh? Yes. Every either sinusoidal or cosine function in time can be represented as the superposition of exponential i k pi t with k positive and k negative, right? And this is why I'm taking here k in z. So here k was only greater than one. So here k is in z. And these coefficients here are complex. Because I have to both build the sin and the cos, right? And there is some sense in this, right? Because I have to, you know, split this ak, bk into ck, so I need a pair, right? Complex coefficients. But this helps. I have this, this kind of, you know, nice Fourier series, more compact a representation of the solution of the wave equation. And you see, when you write this, you lose nothing. Every solution of the wave equation is that way. And every, you know, series that fulfills this, in this form, is a solution of the wave equation, right? This is what Fourier said. Oh, and people started, you know, shaking hands. No, 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 I mean, because, what does it mean, this infinite series, at the time, you know, some in infinite series, it was not that clear, right? And people said, no, 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 this is not uh, certainly true, because, you know, according to D'Alembert, according to D'Alembert, the solution of the wave equation are like this. That people understood much better, right? Because it's easier sometimes. You apply both operators and you check. And then people said, so here you can take an F, which is like this, and therefore this will be a wave with a peak, right? While this one is extremely regular. So then people were complaining. I mean, there are debates, you know, all the contemporary great uh, guys of science, they were debating really whether D'Alembert was right or not. Because, you know, one of the criticisms was that you will never be able to superpose sinusoidal functions and build something irregular. Something that we know today is totally false, because in Fourier series, you can also represent singular functions, right? This is Plancherel. Good. OK, anyhow, nowadays we know that dealing with all possible solutions of the wave equation is like dealing with this. OK, so now let me write down what is the normal derivative on the boundary, because this is the wave equation inside that we don't see, right? 
this is the vibration inside that we don't see. We have represented to to have an analytical uh, guess idea of what are you know the phenomena we are dealing with, but you don't actually have access to this. What we are measuring is the normal derivative on the boundary. Okay, so now, but once I know phi, the normal derivative on the boundary is quite easy, right? How much is this? Now I, I have to take the derivative in x of sine k pi t. I get k pi cosine of k pi, which is minus 1 to the power k or something like this. So what I get is this. So with, if I call dk these new coefficients, right, with dk, which is minus 1 to the power k, k pi, ck. Okay? Good. And now I have to do the integral from 0 to capital T now you have to do the integral from 0 to capital T of phi x 1 t square dt which is the integral from 0 to capital T of the sum on k of dk exponential a chi t square dt. Right? You have to do this. Okay, so this is what you see. Now, in, in our previous argument, based on the D'Alembert idea of waves propagating to the left and to the right, because this other idea was due to Fourier. For D'Alembert, there was this other idea of fronts propagating to the left and to the right, more the billiard idea. This idea was due to Fourier. In this vision of, uh, say, D'Alembert of what is called characteristics, right? Characteristics propagating to the left and to the right, time t equal to emerge quite naturally. I wonder. Well, there is, there is a way to see here the time t equal to. If I give you this integral from 0 to capital T of this uh, Fourier series, do you see the convenience of taking t large or greater than 2 in a way or another? Huh? Periodicity. Periodicity? In which sense? Okay, that's true. And so what? This is what is called an harmonic polynomial. These are exponential functions, complex exponentials that are time periodic, period, time period two, right? For all k. Uh, by the way, in this representation, I have to avoid uh, k equals zero. Huh? Right? Before it didn't matter because I had the sinusoidal k pi s. So for k equals zero, it was not contributing, but. Uh, the term k equals zero doesn't really appear in this uh, representation. This is a detail. What's the problem again with, with the, um, k? Is zero? Sorry? What's the problem again with k? Well, that the formula is, it doesn't really show up in the formula. You could have it and it wouldn't change much, but it's not actually in there. Okay, because, because of, the, of the, 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 the,
be greater than one. Okay. Okay, for k equals zero, this is zero. Yeah, okay. okay. I mean, this kind of details, of course, you have to be a little bit careful. In all these problems, of course, as usual, the devil is in the details, so you have to match the boundary condition, the initial conditions, and then you have to be a little bit careful. But, okay, so this is not a big deal. Now, this is a periodic function of period two, and, uh, uh, and so what? I think what we could say is the following. Because this function is periodic of period 2, integrating in 0, 2 or longer doesn't really make much difference, right? Because if the function is periodic of period 2, in time 2, you have seen everything. This is like, I go to a movie, I like it so much, I see it again, I see it again, I see it, okay. You can see the movie as much as you wish, right? Netflix is free. You can see, you know, same movie again and again, but you will not see anything different, right? Just yes, multiply by the number of times you see. So this is telling me that after after capital T of co uh, equal to when you increase T, the only thing you see is the, again the same copy of the same signal again and again. So the observability constant will decay. Right? Because you are recording more, the constants will shrink. But actually, the fact that inequality is true or not, after t equal 2, nothing will change. Before t equal 2, we know it's not going to happen because of that, you know, propagation speed. So the only concern is really what happens for t equal 2. So what happens for t equal to? Huh? Okay, so yeah, uh, so there, what should I do with that integral from 0 to t of uh, 2, sorry, which is the periodicity time? Inaudible. Acoustic waves didn't get here. What, what should I do with this? So we got to the conclusion that everything is related to what happens in this critical time t equal to. Before that, observability doesn't hold. Uh, after that, because of periodicity, there is no gain. So I'm really interested on this integral from 0 to 2. You just have to check the coefficients. Why? Because it's basis. Right, right. So now what happens is that uh, exponential a not only they are periodic, but this is an orthonormal basis of L2 0 2. Right? And because of that, because of that, this is simply twice the sum of CK square. So why twice? Well, because if you you know you just take the diagonal terms in this double sum, then you will get the integral from 0 to 2 of the modulus of this complex exponential, which is 1, you get 2. So then you get not only the observability inequality, but you, full, you get a full identity, right? So in time 2, what you see in time 2, what you see on the boundary is just a perfect copy of all the energy you have put in the system initially, right? And this is a perfect case where 
the record is ideal. Of course, this is a very simplified model because all coefficients were taken one, there is no damping, there is no nonlinearity, there is nothing depending on x or on t. So this was an ideal model, right? But this is really a, a general principle that tells you very much what's going on for wave propagation. So then you see, to some extent, now depends on the point of view, you could say, is the control theory for finite dimensional systems and PD is the same? To some extent I could say yes, it's the same. Controllability is equivalent to observability. Observability is about proving this kind of observability inequalities, right? There is, however, a novelty, indeed, in the case of PDEs, is that because we are dealing with infinite dimensional systems, the observability inequality cannot be characterized by the Kalman rank condition. And for the wave equation, there is a very particular surprise, and is that for the wave equation, the observability holds if t is 2 or greater, but it doesn't hold when t is less than 2. And this is something fundamentally new with respect to the finite dimensional theory. All the rest is the same. Even the computational aspects say, to some extent, in which I know I have to minimize this functional. In a Hilbert space, something that can be done using say, numerical approximation methods for the wave equation are there either finite differences or finite elements and gradient descent algorithms to compute the minimizers of this functional j. Okay, so now how much you say that is new about the wave equation with respect to the finite dimensional systems? I will say very little. I will say the core is really the same, except that I never thought that the core was the Kalman rank condition. The Kalman rank was a very, you know, particular tool that in the context of finite dimensional systems allow me to, you know, decode the observability inequality. That in general is a kind of property of a different nature. In particular, when you go to the wave equation, you don't need the Kalman rank condition at all. What happens is that naturally you get Fourier series, complex exponentials, orthogonality properties, and you see immediately the emergence of the need of this time, right? Okay? Very good. But then people say, well, this is very particular. Let me, let me consider, for instance, the wave equation that uh, takes into account a little bit the, the mass of the, of the string. So I, I consider the same problem with this, this wave equation, right? So from the point of view of mechanics, there is no doubt this wave equation with this extra potential has to be understood in this way. And in some sense, I'm taking the, you know, into consideration the weight of this, uh, you know, of this string, right? Because the higher is the height, the more there is a, a force pushing down, right? So this is like a heavy chain. This is not a very light uh, chord of the guitar, but this is a heavy chain. In which, you know, whenever you want to push up, then of course the, you know, chain is heavy and the weight, you feel it, okay? This is with unit mass, good? Now, you can do the same. You say, okay, I don't deal with the control problem associated to this. I know it's going to be equivalent to the observability inequality. For the observability inequality, I need to deal with this adjoint wave equation. And in this adjoint wave equation, when I do everything, right?
what I will get is that lambda k is the square root of k squared pi squared plus 1, right? Check this. Check that when you expand this wave equation with mass, this zero order potential, unit potential, then you expand in Fourier series, and rather than getting as before, sorry, there is an i here, plus minus i, that's important, you don't get as before k pi, here you simply get the square root of k squared pi squared plus 1. So you have this extra contribution here, coming from here, right? So if you would put here an m, then you will have here an m. And in the case where m is equal to 0, you will recover the previous formula. OK? Good. OK, so let me try to do the same argument as before. I take now the normal derivative. This is not a big issue. If I take the normal derivative of phi x at x equal 1, I get the sum of i lambda k c k exponential i lambda k t with a plus minus here, right? And then multiply by p k and maybe some minus 1 to the power k or something like this. But the point I am making is that in the end, right, now you are dealing with families of complex exponentials where the lambdas are not integer multiples of pi anymore, right? They are slight variations, right? You know, when k is very large, Lambda k looks very much like k pi. But for k not that large, the value of lambda k is really affected by the presence of m. So now, all these functions are periodic now? Huh? Well, of course, each of them is periodic, right? So this one is periodic of period 2 pi over lambda k. But these lambda k's, they are not all integer multiple of the other. So there is no way you can produce a you know, common periodicity for all of them. Surprisingly enough, Back in 36, there was Ingham, who was working in, I think in Cambridge, probably was one of the students of Pale, or winner, or one of these guys, descendants. So he proved, uh, you know, this paper, very nice one, I mean, just a few pages, you can read it very easily, actually the the, what I will show you, the proof I will show you is, is exactly as the one is written in the paper. Maybe the notation changes a little bit, that's all. Of course, at, at the time, the paper by Ingham was not written in tech, right? But that's uh, the, the only essential difference. So you see, there is also this book where the Ingham inequality is collected with uh, many other applications. This is called Non-Harmonic Fourier Series refers to this. These are complex exponentials that are non-harmonic because they are not all frequencies are integer multiples of the others. And uh, there are also some uh, notes uh, we wrote with Sorin Miku many years ago, but I think they will be of use. In particular, we do all these uh, uh, basics of uh, Ingham inequalities. Then there are some other possible developments, like uh, partially in Trubovich in inverse spectral theory, right? Where uh, the topic is to try to determine the elasticity properties of strings out of spectral properties, right? So there are many related topics. 
But in particular, you know, we are so lucky that Ingham was dealing exactly with the problem we need. So Ingham was really saying, okay, yes, you were so lucky. For some reason, he was not doing observability, but he was exactly doing what we need. He said, listen, you were very lucky because when you are dealing with harmonic polynomials, if you do this, then you get exactly two eyes, the energy that is concentrated on the Fourier coefficient, right? This is the identity we have used before. And now he said, but assume you don't get exactly k pi. There are small changes, like those you encounter here. What happens then? You, you lose completely this identity? Could I at least say that, you know, for this more general situation, I don't get here a 2, but I get some equivalence so that there are two constants, one giving me upper bounds and the other one giving me lower bounds, because this will be sufficient for proving the observability inequality. And this is the inequality, the theorem that Ingham proved. Ingham said, take now, take now a general sequence lambda n. Right? And simply assume that there is a gap, gamma positive. Right? So of course, in the particular case where in the particular case here, the gap is how much? It's pi, right? Because the gap between k pi and k plus one pi is always pi. The gap is pi. And he said if time is greater than pi over 2, pi over gamma, sorry, in this case t greater than 1, then the integral of this series square is giving me an upper bound on the square norm in literal 2 of the Fourier coefficients. So, well, I am a bit surprised because in the case k pi, here I get time 1, while here I was getting time 2. Why? Why I get here time 2 and here I get time 1? Well, pay attention that in this statement, t goes from minus t to capital T. So the length, really, of this, if you, if you translate, this is invariant by translation, it goes from 0 to 2t, right? So the true time, length of the time interval you are considering here is 2 pi over gamma. So it, they match perfectly. So this is fantastic, because this is a complete generalization of the identity we got for harmonic polynomials. This is a perfect generalization of what the identity we got for harmonic polynomials is exactly what do I need to prove observability because observability is precisely this lower bound but because this is the normal derivative square and this is related to the energy of the initial data. I know how much time I need. This is even sharp when I go down to the pure wave equation because the gap is gamma equal 1. So I need a time 2 pi, 2, two sorry, sorry, the, the gap is pi, so I need, I need a time which is twice 1, so 2, I get a sharp time, and the only thing I need is this gap condition. So it's fantastic. And uh, then, uh, you know, using this kind of income inequality, you can prove observability inequalities for many wave equations and wave-like equations, and this way the program is complete, right? See? Si. Who first used this in control? I don't know. I don't know. So was it, you know, probably this was already in the paper by Leon since I reviewed in 88. I don't know whether it was, uh, it was earlier than that because no, but Russell was not, didn't, at the time, was not that clear that there was a link between observability and, and controllability, precisely, right? So Lyons was the person who indicated in that paper, 
that in order to prove controllability, you better do observability. And I think probably in one of the comments of that paper, he says, well, in one, in one space dimension, you can use this kind of Ingham-like inequalities. That, of course, were known much before, 36. How did you find it without internet? Well, there was at the time there were, you know, but this was, uh, there was in, I mean, all these uh, uh, Svart's thesis was very much on this. Laurent Svart's PhD thesis was on that topic. And then there were descendants of Svart's uh, that were working on this. People like Meyer, Yves Meyer, you know, on the one in, in, in Wavelets, I mean, they were experts on this. Berlin Maliaban, Berlin Maliaban, Paul Maliaban, a French mathematician also, the one in probability. Berlin Maliaban have a, a, a fantastic generalization of Ingham to, you know, that was one of the fundamental developments in analysis in the in the 50s or so. So there were there were several groups in Paris knowing this kind of inequalities, right? Okay. So now, can, can you check that uh, the gap is fulfilled? So given an M, uh, could, you, could you check that the gap is fulfilled? Uh, 